I get to reintroduce our speakers. So we have uh, coming back is Kayla Strother, uh, uh, serves as a nurse practitioner with the Addiction Consult and Education Service at the University of Kentucky uh, Chandler Medical Center. She has experience working as a registered nurse in the trauma intensive care unit at UKMC and is, as a clinical nurse instructor with the Moorhead State University uh, back, Bachelors of Nursing program. She has strong interest in staff education and development with a concentration on the care of patients with substance use disorders and is an active participant in community outreach programs that work to educate the public on substance use disorders and Narcan administration. Uh, and Angela Linder, who is currently the nurse navigator for the Addiction Consult and Education Service ACES at UK Chandler Medical Center. She uh, received her Bachelor's of Science in Nursing from Berea College. She is certified in Psychiatric Mental Health Nursing with the American Nursi Nurses Credentialing Center, and she has 20 years of experience in acute inpatient mental health. So welcome back to our speakers. Thank you guys for being here and thank you for having us back. Um, so just a review of the practice gap and educational needs. Harm reduction practices can reduce the risk of illness or injury among people who use drugs. Informal settings such as healthcare corrections or recovery and treatment programs can be great opportunities for conversations about harm reduction. And just a reminder of our learning object objectives from last time. Um, they were to discuss the history and philosophy of harm reduction as related to drug use, articulate benefits and challenges of harm reduction and preventative medicine practices in formal healthcare settings, employee specific harm reduction interventions for different routes of administrations and different substances. And our expected outcomes were to improve the understanding of opportunities for harm reduction among people who use drugs, and to utilize a client-centered, empowering, collaborative approach, creating harm reduction plans with people who use drugs in a healthcare setting. And so just as a reminder to get us back into the spirit of harm reduction, um, we just, again, wanted to remind the definition that we like for harm reduction, which is an organized series of strategies designed to reduce the harmful effects of alcohol and behavior and other drugs and behaviors to individuals, families, and societies at large. And it's a continuum of possibilities. And we use harm reduction, again, in everyday life without really thinking about it. And some of the examples um, we discussed last time were sunscreen, seat belts. I think someone had mentioned bike helmets before. And then harm reduction strategies we use in relation to substance use. Um, and some examples of that are our syringe exchange programs, safer injection education, MOUD, naloxone, just, just as some examples. And I think it's always changing as far as harm reduction needs. So we learn new ways to reduce harm every day by just listening to our clients. So what can we gain from harm reduction um, and providing that education? So I think it, increases understanding, it challenges stigma, improves communication, fosters trust. It leads to greater engagement with our clients um, and it also helps empower, motivate and uplift them. And it leads to real tangible change. Um, it delivers immediate benefits to the individual and the community even when we don't see that happening. And that reminded me of a, a story um, where I was working with a gentleman a few weeks back who was here for six weeks. Um, he was injecting substances. He had a, a bone infection from that. Um, he didn't really want to have a verbal conversation about safer injection practices, but he said, I'll take your written packet. I'll look over it and I'll let you know if I have any questions. So I followed up with him a couple of days after that. And when I walked in the room, he had his packet pulled out. He was on the phone with a friend actually, and they were discussing um, safer ways to dispose of their used syringes. So I thought that was awesome and a good reminder of why we do this work. And so how does it work and where do I start? Um, again, these are some things to, to ask yourself. Um, assume you don't know. Um, ask your patients, they're a great resource of what education that they need. 
um, talk to others with experience, um, seek out additional education. So I think it's awesome that you guys are here working on improving your competency and building your confidence. And we're gonna keep going today with some more specific questions and scenarios for practice. So last week we um, touched a little bit on the different types of um, substances that um, patients use and how to go about um, using those substances in a little bit safer way. Um, so we wanted to retouch on opioids because that's the one that we most commonly talk with our patients about or um, we most commonly see opioid use disorder. So the two major risks that come with opioids is the risk of overdose and the risk of infection. Um, so when talking about overdose, um, the factors that play into um, that risk are incons inconsistent potency, unsafe supply, and changes in tolerance. So inconsistent potency and unsafe supply kind of go hand in hand. There can be varying amounts of fentanyl cut into um, other opioids or other substances. Um, and then the changes in tolerance, if a patient or a person goes and spends time in the hospital, um, are incarcerated for a period of time or have cessation of use from a period for a period of time that can significantly decrease um, their tolerance to opioids. And so if they do have a return to use, then um, they're at an increased risk from overdose from that standpoint. So the strategies that we touched on were to carry naloxone. Um, at UK, we do bedside distribution with our patients. We're able to get that from the pharmacies here in the hospital, but you can pick up naloxone from retail pharmacies or health departments. The other strategy that we touched on was medications for opioid use disorder, um, buprenorphine or suboxone, methadone, and then um, also naltrexone uh, or Vivitrol. And then the third strategy um, was using test doses. So um, if you are getting your substance from a different supplier, um, make sure you're using just a very, very small dose initially. Um, this kind of goes into the unsafe supply inconsistent potency. Um, factors. And then we also um, promote fentanyl test strips as well. Um, and then we have a little plug there. It says potency can be very inconsistent even within the same bag. So that's something to keep in mind. We use the phrase start low, go slow. Um, and then the other um, risk is the risk of infection. And that has to do with the routes of administration, which um, we'll talk about here in a little bit, but in regards to kind of these strategies, we did have some questions that popped up on um, Narcan specifically. So we'll touch on that here. Um, so some myths about Narcan that we wanted to address. Um, these are things that um, we hear very commonly um, when working with patients with substance use disorder. So one of the biggest ones we hear is it doesn't work on fentanyl. So that's not true. Fentanyl is an opioid. Uh, it's a very strong opioid. Um, but it does, in fact, work on work on fentanyl. Um, we've heard I'm immune to Narcan, um, so nobody's immune to Narcan. <laughs> um, it just may take more. Um, so if you're using, say, a very strong a very strong opioid like fentanyl, you may require multiple doses of Narcan to feel or to experience the effect of Narcan for Narcan to be able to knock the opioid off the receptor um, and prevent it from rebinding. Um, <laughs> The other myth we hear is Narcan works immediately. Sometimes it can take two to three minutes um, for Narcan to take effect. So it's important that you administer Narcan, you stay with the person and you call 911. Um, you may need to perform rescue, breathe them, rebreathing, put them in the recovery position. Um, and they may require even a second um, or sometimes third dose of Narcan. Um, and again, this goes back to it may just take more for the Narcan to get working in your system, depending on what substance you were exposed to. Um, the other myth is Narcan kills the opioid in your system. So as I just mentioned, Narcan doesn't um, get rid of the opioid in your system, but rather it takes the place of the opioid on your opioid receptor. So it bumps opioid kind of off your receptors, but the opioids remain kind of floating around in your body. And it's important to recognize that Narcan has a shorter half-life than um, opioids do. So um, you get benefit from Narcan from a certain period of time, and then that Narcan wears off. And as the Narcan wears off, the opioid can rebind to the receptors. And so you can overdose again or um, have like reestablished effects of the opioids even after you've been given Narcan. So 
people sometimes require a, a second dose of Narcan um, if you notice that they're experiencing symptoms of an opioid withdrawal, even after just receiving the first dose. And again, and what, what is considered the recovery position? Oh, I'm sorry. That's um, side lying. Um, so it prevents aspiration if the patient were to vomit. Um, and then, sorry. <laughs> um, and so then you, like I mentioned, you want to administer the Narcan, stay with the person and call 911. Um, so jumping back to um, the risk of infection with uh, opioid use, we want to talk about injection specific risks. So the risks here related to injection use are exposure to bloodborne infections such as hep C, HIV, um, soft tissue and skin infection and vessel and nerve injury. So as we talked uh, last week, we there is um, a hierarchy of um, safe injection use. So we think of it kind of like a ladder, um, you know, the highest rung is our gold standard. You're using a new sterile needle each time you're using sterile water. Um, you're using a clean filter, a clean or new sterile cooker, um, and you're cleaning your skin with alcohol. So that's like everything that we could possibly ask for if a patient were using substances, but of course that's not always a feasible option for patients um, or persons using substances. So um, we do ask the, the person um, about their injection practices and kind of use each um, step of the injection process as like an opportunity for a conversation or a teaching point. So again, as we mentioned last week, um, talking about the syringe and needle use. Are they sharing that um, syringe and needle? Are they reusing it? Are they cleaning that in between with bleach, hydrogen peroxide, even soap and water? What are they cleaning their skin, skin with if they don't have alcohol um, swabs? Are they able to you know, wash the skin with soap and water? Are they able to take a shower right beforehand? What are they using for their mix? Um, like we mentioned, sterile water is best. Next step down would be an unopened bottle of water. Um, are they using tap water? Is the tap water well water or city water? Um, are they using any standing water outside, pond, puddle, creek water? Um, are they heating their water prior to using? So are they um, cooking their substance after they mix it? Um, that helps to decrease some of the um, bacteria exposure. In regards to a filter, are they able to access clean cotton filters? If they're using a cigarette filter, is it new? Is it reused? Um, we ask patients about, uh, licking the needle. Um, you know, it's, it, you can ask why the patient does that, but, um, the important thing would be to, um, educate them on the, um, infection risk with doing that and kind of figuring out an alternative, um, to their why. And then asking, um, where do they, um, inject the substances, um, on their body, arms, leg, neck, groin. Um, and I'll touch on that in the next slide as well. So we showed this um, picture the last week. So this is talking about um, locations of injecting. Um, so we have the green boxes, which are considered the safer areas, um, less risky um, injection areas, and then the red, which are considered the more risky sites. So for the red, these places typically have more arteries, nerves, there's an increased risk of infection and increased risk of overdose and stroke. Um, with the green areas, the less risky areas, they have fewer, fewer arteries and nerves, there's a slightly decreased risk of infection, slightly decreased risk of um, overdose and slightly decreased risk of uh, stroke. So we wanna make sure that we're educating patients about the difference between the red and the green areas. Um, so we also shared this last week. So if you um, go in to talk with a patient and you just have a few brief moments to kind of cover um, some harm reduction material, um, we recommend using the arms mnemonic. So talking about the area where they're injecting at, talking quickly about the reversal agent. Do they carry Narcan? How do you use Narcan? What exactly does Narcan do? Um, talking about their materials. Um, do they have access to um, you know, the gold standard materials like we just talked about, how do we get them access to those materials? Um, and then their surroundings, kind of what area, um, or like what is their environment like when they're using? Are they using um, with other people? Are they using alone? Um, if they're using alone, promoting using that um, 
hotline um, that we talked about last week. Um, I'm not sure if we have a picture of that, but we may be able to share it in the chat um, where the person can call and someone can stay on the phone with them um, while they're using. And if they stop responding, then they'll call for um, EMS assistance. Um, so, and then, you know, obviously just talking about the gold standards of each of these areas um, in the few minutes that you may have with the person. All right, so to kind of start this uh, conversation, we wanted to see how comfortable people are talking about harm reduction. So uh, there's a couple of ways we can do this. The first would be to, to scroll where you see the, the pop-up and it says uh, annotate, and then you click the annotate button and you can choose a stamp, and then you can choose like a symbol, like a star, a heart, an X, or a check mark, and then you would place it along the line where you would say you are. Uh, if you're not able to get that to work, you can also just put one through 10, 10 being extremely comfortable and one not being comfortable in the chat. I love seeing all those really high numbers. That makes me very happy. <laughs> um, so one of the questions that we, um, Got was asking, um, can you expand on strategies when talking to healthcare providers about harm reduction? Um, so we can pull up those talking points. So this is something that um, as a provider um, or team member on the addiction medicine team at UK that we um, experience a lot, just having to um, the, having the opportunity to interact with other clinical staff um, in regards to treating patients with substance use disorder. So um, the things that we typically wanna focus on when we're talking with um, other staff about um, harm reduction and, and how to go about having that interaction with a mutual patient is we wanna make sure that um, we're encouraging the clinical staff to, to reframe the, the thought process of substance use as a moral failing into a medical diagnosis or disease of the brain. So what that looks like is when it's it's thought of as a moral failing, that is the thought of this is a bad person because they use substances. Um, what we encourage the framework to be and and is that substance use disorder is is a disease. It is a diagnosed medical condition. Um, and when patients are exhibiting symptoms of continued substance use, um, maybe some maladaptive behaviors, um, cravings to use substances, those are all symptoms of a disease. And so we want to encourage um, other staff members to think of it as such, as opposed to um, taking kind of maybe their own thoughts and beliefs and um, kind of applying that to, to this particular patient population. Um, I often encourage clinical staff to compare this to other chronic disease diagnoses, so diabetes, heart disease. So when we're talking about patients potentially um, being on medication for opioid use disorder, comparing that to like insulin in a patient with diabetes. So that medicine is necessary for the treatment of, of diabetes. Insulin is necessary for the treatment of diabetes in the same way that medications for opioid use disorder can be necessary in the treatment for opioid use disorder. And that that um, making that comparison kind of is a little more, is an easier way to kind of for people to wrap their head around that concept. Um, so we wanna make sure we're sticking to the evidence as well. Um, you know, there's, there's been so much research done to show that harm reduction actually works. It, it, it really helps reduce morbidity mortality in this patient population. And, you know, a lot of times medical providers or clinical staff can really relate to that. Um, and then doing something called, um, kind consistency. So language matters, your language and, um, the type of language that you allow around you. So, um, when we talk about using person first language, um, we talk about, you know, a patient with substance use disorder as opposed to an addict. So this kind consistency is all about, you know, using this person first language in your own day to day life when you speak about patients with substance use disorder um, encourages other people to to use the same. Um, and also with that being said, politely and respectfully um, 
encouraging person first language when somebody uses non person first language. So when a person says, oh, an addict, politely say a person with substance use disorder. And over time, in an ideal situation, that language with the other person tends to change because they're constantly hearing you use that person person first language. Um, so we really kind of hit that hard, um, you know, with the clinical staff um, here in the hospital. Um, and we find that it do it does make a big difference. Um, the other thing that I like to hit on um, is is telling staff um, that it's not about you. These symptoms that this patient is experiencing in regards to their substance use disorder, it is it is not about you. There, it is not a manipulative behavior. It is not um, anything to do with um, you know going against your personal beliefs or anything like that. It's it is about this patient and what they need, and and they are exhibiting symptoms that indicate that they need help. Um, so I really try to push that of it's not about you. It's about the patient. Another question that we got is, what are the recommendations when you know this may be your only interaction with a client? Um, so some talking points for that. Um, first, um, and I think it probably goes the longest way, is, is establish respect as a priority. Because if you're being respectful and kind, your patients are going to be um, way more open to talking to you about the information that you're hoping to share. Um, we also like to be concise, relevant, and simple. Um, we try to triage the best that we can. So again, if you've got a quick interaction with the patient and you know it might be your only interaction, referring to that arms mnemonic that Kayla touched on, um, we also provide a lot of written information. Um, if they're not interested in reviewing it with you in person, then at least they have it in writing. We have actually a harm reduction packet that we give folks that has community resources, support recovery meeting information, information about overdose prevention, um, information about safer use strategies as well. And then we will either bring a bedside Narcan to the patient um, and educate them on how to use that, or we'll call in at least a year's worth of Narcan to the pharmacy so they can get that before they go. Um, if there's someone who is on medication for opioid use disorder, we will make sure that they have follow-up in place and written information and, and have a verbal conversation with them so they understand what their next steps are. Um, and again, um, that linkage to community resources, if someone um, says you know, they wanna go to a sober living facility or treatment, then we, we will help link them to those resources. Um, so I think someone put in there, how many units are included in a year's worth of Narcan? Um, so we, we give a person a, a, a box and then 11 refills. That was a good question. Thank you. And then um, I think we're ready for the next slide. Sorry. <laughs> So one of the other questions that we got um, was what harm reduction services do, does the ACEs team offer at UK? Um, so harm reduction education, just like we're doing here, um, linkage to treatment, as Angela had mentioned. Um, so we can help provide linkage to residential recovery, um, intensive outpatient, standard outpatient, sober living, um, peer support groups, um, just a number of different types of treatment options. Um, we can provide MOUD, get patients started on that here and help them um, establish and care with the clinic to provide that after discharge. Um, we do supply um, some safer injection supplies. So we have these fun little packets that we give patients um, who have expressed that they have um, they're not interested in stopping um, injection use of substances. So in that kit, um, we have a little sharps container. Um, we provide them with clean cotton uh, filters. They're little like dental filler fillers, um, alcohol swabs, um, fentanyl test strips. Um, we don't provide any syringes or needles in those packets. Um, I think those are, that's most of the supplies. Um, and then obviously we give them a Narcan kit, as Angela mentioned. Um, 
we offer support and advocacy. Um, so making sure that um, they're heard by other medical providers and other team members um, about what their goals and their intentions are um, during their time here in the hospital and then after discharge. And we try to hit with these patients every single day. So um, as a provider, I'm seeing these patients um, ideally twice a week, um, but we also have our peer support specialists coming and rounding on these patients, um, typically about once a week. And then Angela and Alyssa, our social worker, um, coming in and seeing these patients one to two times a week. So we're really very frequently checking in um, with this patient population um, and just offering different dynamics of support. Um, you know, I offer more kind of medical support, whereas Angela and Alyssa offer more counseling support and Alyssa obviously peer support. So um, just making sure that they're getting opportunities to talk with different types of people in different roles um, pretty much every day. If anyone has any follow-up questions or wants to uh, ask clarifying questions, feel free to, to do so at any point. Um, but I think we're ready to move on to the next one. Is that correct? Yes. Um, so one of the things that we um, get questions on is it's common that people are using multiple substances. How does that change a conversation about harm reduction? So when we talk about using multiple substances, uh, one of the biggest things we hit on is an unsafe supply. So as we had mentioned last week, um, so many different types of substances are cut with fentanyl. It is a very cheap filler. Um, and a lot of times people will market a product as being you know, a benzodiazepine or a stimulant, whereas it's either all or cut with a portion of fentanyl um, or other filler products. Um, so we wanna make sure that people are aware of that, that um, while you may, be attempting to use heroin and methamphetamines, you could be getting fentanyl of both. Um, and that kind of rolls into um, the concept of speedballing. So mixing a stimulant with an opioid um, in the same time of use. Um, so there is kind of a myth out there that using stimulants at the same time of opioids increases um, the safety of uh, or the decreases the risk of opioid overdose. That's not true. Um, and unfortunately, we see it often where patients, again, are, are trying to use two different substances at the same time, and they end up getting just one of the same sub substance, which is typically fentanyl. Um, so just making sure that, that they're aware of that, promoting fentanyl test strips, promoting um, the start low, go slow, promoting test doses, um, those are ways to decrease the risk of opioid overdose in instances in which patients may be having an unsafe supply or um, speedballing. Um, we also spend a lot of time focusing on um, reducing risk in substances that can interact with each other. So um, benzodiazepines and alcohol, um, opioids and benzodiazepines, all of those three substances are, are central nervous system depressants. So combining any type of central nervous system depressant with another CNS depressant is going to increase your risk of, of overdose, um, you know, slow or stop your breathing and, and the potential for death. So making sure that people know that if you choose to use these substances together, there is a significant increased risk, um, you know, as you would say, if you were to use opioids and, and a stimulant. So um, I have a follow-up question, actually. So is it like common knowledge that these substances interact poorly together, or is it not? And then, sorry, there's a follow-up question to that question. Is there like a handout that people can look at to know what not to mix? Sure. So um, say it's in my experience um, with the standard patient population, that it's probably not super common knowledge that these substances can interact. Um, I would say when when we talk about like downers versus uppers, um, I think the concept is most people understand that combining downers with downers increases, you know, those effects of those substances. But specifically from substance to substance, I don't know that that interaction of necessarily like benzodiazepines and alcohol 
is, is common knowledge. Um, I work with a lot of patients who do frequently combine, especially opioids with alcohol, um, or they're on buprenorphine based products or methadone and combining that with alcohol or other benzodiazepines. And, um, quite a few of them are almost alarmed when I tell them that that's something that they can die from combining those, those products together. Um, especially because alcohol is not illegal, right? And so um, I think the the assumption is, is, oh, if it's not illegal, it's fine for me to use even in combination with these other substances. Um, in regards to um, kind of a flyer, um, I don't know, Angela, if we have access to, to anything like that specifically. Um, for me, it's it's definitely just something that I try to hit on during my patient visits or if I'm prescribing a, a new substance is making sure that, um, or providing harm reduction, just making sure that I hit um, kind of those points. All right, thank you. It looks like, okay. Shirley, you have a question? I do. I wanted to ask Kayla, uh, she mentioned the methadone and alcohol. I now have a participant who has had a return to use, but she's on methadone and using alcohol. And I was trying to guide the conversation today, but I'm not sure the risk of that. So can you kind of educate me a little bit on that? So I know how to probably more explain that better to her as far as the risk of it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the way I kind of pitch it to patients is as I talk about this, the um, mechanism of action with both different substances. So if we talk about methadone, methadone can be sedating in, in you know, certain doses. Um, you can overdose on methadone. Um, it can slow your breathing, depress your central nervous system, make you very tired. And then, you know, obviously the potential for overdose and death if you were to take too much of it, right? Same thing happens with alcohol. You know, if a person drinks too much, they become over sedated, um, you know, they pass out, you know, things like that. And so I talk about even in like mild to moderate use of both, while those risks individually may not be super high, if you combine them together, that essentially doubles the risk, right? Um, so while a little bit of methadone is fine, a little bit of alcohol is fine used separately, right? When you use them in combination, that's where the danger comes in. That's usually how I explain it to my patients. Yeah, and also to add on to that, I think when you're using or mixing multiple substances, your perception of how much you can do is, is skewed. Like you may not realize um, that you're taking too much. So that's one way I'll talk to patients about it too. Yeah, and just, again, okay, thanks Angela, to add on to that too, um, you know, like the toler, like, like she said, the tolerance to having, you know, six beers not on methadone, right, is going to be different versus six beers on methadone. Like there's going to be a, just a processing difference in the level of sedation and potential increased risk for, for that. Um, is that true of buprenorphine products as well? Or yes, is it is. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, any opioid um, and alcohol, it's the same, the same risk. But that's a good question since even, you know, buprenorphine is just a partial agonist. Um, but yes, the, the same rules still apply. And then for naltrexone, it's not an opioid. And then it's sometimes used for alcohol use disorder. And that's just to stop cravings. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. So um, naltrexone doesn't have any sort of sedating effects to it. Um, it works on certain neurotransmitters in the brain to help decrease cravings or the euphoric effects of, of alcohol use. Um, so if you were to drink on top of that, um, you wouldn't have that, that kind of combining effect like you would with opioids or benzodiazepines. Got it. And then one more follow-up question. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> so it's okay. Buprenorphine is a partial agonist. So would those effects be, so if you were trying to, like if someone was trying to make a decision about MOUD, knowing that they wanted to still drink, would buprenorphine be safer than methadone in that, or is it the same? Just recommend, I, I would say it's the same. Um, I think from, I'm sure that there's a whole 
laundry list explanation from like a pharmacological standpoint <laughs> of you know the risk but in general it's it's the same an opioid in combination with alcohol is going to increase your risk um i don't think it really matters what type of opioid you're looking at helpful. Thank you. I'll, I'll, um, sorry, I'll chime in. Sorry if that's okay. This no, is that would be great. Yes. Yeah. Thank no, you. no, 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 actually when we're thinking about, right, it's a continuum. I would actually say, you know, the, the take-home point is opioid is a depressant, alcohol is a depressant. So that doesn't change. But when we're looking at less harm, correct, actually the partial agonist buprenorphine would be safer, but it doesn't make it safe. So it's, again, it's like, reducing harm from, you know, the mix of opioid, full agonist opioids and alcohol, then partial agonist opioid and alcohol, and then, you know, of course, no alcohol. Um, and I would say in those conversations, always going back to being on effective medication for opioid use disorder treatment is going to reduce, you know, rate of mortality, right? We, we've seen that in, in our MOUD uh, talk already with Dr. Hawthorne. So remembering that, if, you, if the, the conversation of being on medication versus not with with ongoing alcohol uses, you're going to be safer on medication for all cause of death, right? But, and then of the MOUD, naltrexone would be the safest, and then buprenorphine, and then, you know, methadone. Um, so I'll just leave it at that. Thank you, Katrina. I appreciate that clarification. And it looks like we have another question from the chat. Can you overdose on buprenorphine alone? So as long as you have um, overall healthy organs, you know, kidney, liver, lungs, um, then I would say it's the risk of death from overdose on buprenorphine, right, because of the ceiling effect on the respiratory depression, because that's how someone dies of an opioid overdose is that drive to breathe goes down. Um, that ceiling effect as a partial agonist, it would limit that higher, higher doses, put you at um, increased risk of, of that overdose death. So, however, you know, if somebody already has respiratory breathing issues with lung disease, heart disease and they just can't handle even the level of that ceiling of the effect of the buprenorphine, then then they could have a death because of too much buprenorphine. Um, but general, um, then I would say, you know, no, alone without another depressing depressant like alcohol, benzodiazepines or, or you know, other opioids. I don't know if Kayla, if you want, if there's anything else that frequently comes up in those conversations that I miss. Oh, I think that pretty much, you pretty much covered it. Thank you. I appreciate it. So one of the other questions we had was what strategies do you recommend when someone, when meeting with a client who has likely lost tolerance due to forced withdrawal? Some examples of that, someone who's coming from jail, hospital, or a residential setting that does not offer medications for opioid use disorder, do you have key bullet points or potential script for harm reduction points to cover? Um, so I would say make sure that they know that they're, make sure they understand their risk. Um, tolerance decreases after 24 hours. So for most patients that I talk with, whether their plan going forward is, is to continue use or to be on medication for opioid use disorder, I'll, I'll say to them on the day of discharge, look, right now you're at one of your highest risks for overdose. Um, and if you have a return to use, we talk about managed dosing, starting low and going slow and encouraging test shots. And we also talk about those other overdose strategies, Narcan, not using alone, um, fentanyl test strips. And um, we also caution um, about the potency of supply. Um, and, and that's even within your own supply. And then a linkage to community resources and Narcan. And another common question we get is, aren't we encouraging or condoning drug use? Um, so the core of the matter is, is people have a right to self-determination and people who are using drugs typically don't need our permission to use if that's what they choose to do. Um, and then I think it's also important to cover that a person who is not alive can't recover 
um, and that we are just stewards of information. And then harm reduction is an evidence-based practice. So this conversation can be really uncomfortable to have with people sometimes. And I, I think I've had some of my most uncomfortable conversations with family members um, who don't support kind of harm reduction education. Their, their stance on it is abstinence or nothing. Um, I remember when I first started working here, I had, was talking to a, um, a young lady, I think she was around 19 or 20. She was in the hospital because of a near fatal overdose. Um, we were called on the day of discharge for her. Um, and so she, she invited me in her room. Her grandmother was at bedside. She wanted grandmother at bedside and to get the information. And she wanted to know more about how to protect herself in the future from an overdose. So we were reviewing Narcan, fentanyl test strips, dose management, starting low, going slow. And I looked over and the grandmother just looked horrified. So I walked out of that room thinking, am I doing the right thing? Should I have said something different? I consulted with Alyssa and, and told her kind of about what happened. And some, you know, the advice that she gave me, we talked through it, she gave me some good advice. So um, now one of the things I'll say is, you know, I, I would love if your son, daughter, friend walks out of here and never uses again, that would be my hope too, but, it, but it's a possibility, a real possibility that they might. And so what my role is, is to give them the information that they need to keep themselves as safe as possible. And I would rather them have this information and not ever need it than need it and not have it. So I feel like that that's been, um, a really good talking point when you run into the kind of those difficult situations. And so now we're gonna practice. We have some scenarios to go over. And before we go over those scenarios, just um, mindful of the things that we're looking for when we're trying to gather information from patients to, to kind of gear what our, our harm reduction education is gonna cover. Um, so the risk is, you know, what, what is the risk itself? What drug is being used? What's their risk of overdose? Um, the set is kind of what they bring into the situation. How are they feeling? Are they anxious? Are they in pain? Um, are they in withdrawal? Are their basic needs being met? And then the setting, um, what is the physical environment or that the harm, potential harm is occurring? Is it on the street? Um, is it, are there police bystanders around? So these are factors that we use when trying to gather the information so we can prioritize, um, again, our education and strategies and establish some of those mutual goals with the patient. Um, so scenario one, this is a patient that we, we actually had here in the hospital. Um, Chris is a 32 year old male. He was admitted to the hospital with osteomyelitis and several necrotic fingers. Um, he had a history of multiple abscesses in his hands. He reported daily use of IV heroin and stimulants when he could get them. He was previously a patient with UK Smart Clinic, but he fell out of care earlier in the year. Um, he had been living in a homeless encampment. Um, he said Suboxone had previously helped him, but now due to concerns about inadequate craving control and pain, he wanted to start methadone. Um, I think some of the, the things that we did are already populated. Um, so one thing that we did, he, he verbalized some interest in pursuing recovery housing to, as a means to keep himself safer. So he decided he wanted to pursue sober living. We were able to connect him with that resource. He ended up going to a sober living at discharge. So that was awesome. Um, we also maintained his connection with the SMART clinic. Um, so the SMART Clinic actually reached out to him while he was here, and that actually gave us a little bit of rapport and street, not a little bit of rapport and credit with him because he, he, he knew that he could trust us. They said, you know, the ACES team is really awesome. You should really work with them. They'll help you. Um, we were able to engage his family as a support system. And then our providers felt like um, methadone for his opioid use disorder would be the best plan for him due to the ongoing craving control and pain. So we were able to start him on methadone and connect him to a methadone clinic at discharge. Um, we talked to him about Narcan and gave him a bedside kit. And then when we were doing 
you know, assess an assessment of his use, um, we were able to identify that he was using Mountain Dew to mix his shots. So that was an awesome opportunity for us to talk about the risk of bacteria due to the, the sugary content and, and just it not being a sterile water source. So we were able to discuss the hierarchy of um, best water with him to, to help him um, potentially change that practice. All right, I think this next one won't have the <laughs> the, the things populated so we can pull the pull the audience. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So this was another scenario. Um, we had a 24 year old male who was admitted to the emergency room with sickle cell crisis. He said that he was recently discharged from his pain clinic for recreational cocaine and marijuana use, and he had since been purchasing oxycodone on the street to maintain his previous prescribed dose. His urine was positive for oxycodone and fentanyl, and he said that he had never intentionally used fentanyl and didn't wish to do so, and he was really concerned about his risk for accidental overdose. So thinking about his um, risk set and setting, what would be some of the harm reduction strategies we could try with this gentleman? Okay, so some of the things that we did do with this gentleman, naloxone education, MOUD, awesome. Share the never use alone site. Awesome. Those are all really good suggestions. And we did exactly a lot of the things you guys suggested. Um, so we, we attempted to reconnect him with his primary care doctor for pain management, but but we were worried that that might be a challenge um, because sometimes it's really difficult to get into a pain management clinic when you're still actively using. So we also offered him medication for opioid use disorder um, as a secondary. Um, obviously it's a, a good option, but that wasn't his goal. So we provided Narcan and overdose prevention education. Um, and we discussed fentanyl test strips and provided information on where to purchase those or get them. You guys covered it. That was awesome. Angela, I have a question. Sorry. Yeah. Um, when you said you offered MUD, but he's not interested, did he say why? Um, he just, you know, he just didn't feel like it was his, he didn't feel like it was going to be adequate to, to manage. Um, what was going on. And he didn't also feel like that he had an opioid use disorder. So had he tried any kind of buprenorphine before to say that it wasn't going to manage his pain? I, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. Okay, thanks. I'm just curious because a lot of times I, I, I hear those things and it's because of those myths that yeah. won't help with the pain or again, like, but I don't have an opioid use disorder, um, but buprenorphine could be a safer um, and effective pain management medication, um, right? And, so, so that's and those are this. conversations that our, our providers do have with folks who have that um, misinformation and kind of that that's their stance on what's happening. So there is a question about the different kinds of buprenorphine, and are some so like is it are some only used for pain? Um, yes, but it's a different kind of clinic usually where you would go to, to connect with that. Um, but, but it is a proof of pain and Dr. Nichols can probably share more. Yeah, and, and I guess right here, I'll just say, I'll make a plug. Um, I believe it's what December or January, Dr. Oler will be presenting on pain and opioid use disorder. Um, and so we'll learn more about all those different formulations of buprenorphine. Um, and the ones that are indicated for pain and the ones that have the indication for treatment of opioid use disorder. Thanks. Um, so I'll touch on scenario three. Um, so this is a 40 year old man who is currently living on the street and outside of shelters using heroin and methamphetamine by injection use presents to the hospital with septic arthritis of the knee. Um, his psychiatric comorbidities include bipolar disorder and PTSD. The patient is intermittently hostile, reactive, and verbally abusive towards staff. He chooses not to receive the entire course of treatment for his infection multiple times and returns after several encounters 
with a new heart infection or endocarditis. Um, so thinking of the points that Angela had touched on, what um, what uh, would you guys feel we need to do with this patient? If you can put it in the chat. John, if you wanna go ahead and pull up um, the points to connect to mental health treatment, yes. Mm -hmm. Treat endocarditis, MED, psychiatry, support dog. I love that, yes. <laughs> Educated on importance of completing antibiotics, local syringe exchange programs. Mm -hmm. So um, important points for this patient. Um, so repeat visit from team members. So um, every interaction, um, suicide screening, yes. Mm -hmm. So every uh, interaction or opportunity we have to talk with a patient is an important one. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're going in um, and we're covering points um, that are one, important to the patient and two, talking about the importance of, um, like you guys mentioned, completing the antibiotics, um, harm reduction techniques, um, and importantly also from different team members. So we had touched on this in our last presentation about how one team member may connect really, really well with the patient, but another team member may not connect in the same way with that same patient. Um, so getting different perspectives, um, different roles um, is important to um, be doing with, with the patients. Um, so unconditional positive regard. So this is going in um, and every time the patient comes in, interacting with them in a positive way. So, hey, Mr. Smith, you know, how are you doing? I'm happy to see you. Um, I'm happy that you're back to get treatment for your infection. Um, what can we talk about with you today that's important to you? Could we talk about goal setting? Could we talk about harm reduction? Um, you know, thanking them for allowing the opportunity for you to speak with them um, and really fostering just the positive connection between our team and with the patient. Um, and if you do that every single time the patient comes in, as opposed to going in and you know, oh, I, I see you're back again, you know, having the mindset of, oh, you know, he's, he's just going to leave again. That doesn't foster any sort of um, beneficial or productive relationship. Um, like y'all had mentioned, educating on overdose prevention and safer use strategies um, and setting limits and behavioral expectations. So um, this is letting the patient know these certain behaviors um, of hostility, reactiveness, verbal abuse, towards staff um, aren't appropriate. What is the root cause of those behaviors? Are you in pain? Are you having cravings to use? Do you feel like certain aspects of your care um, aren't being addressed? Is, is Are you having um, you know, uh, challenges with staff, certain staff members? So just exploring kind of the root of the problems of, of those behaviors um, can really be beneficial and just allowing that patient the opportunity to express how they're feeling. Um, and not going in in an accusatory way of um, this challenging interaction is something the patient did, or you, you know, just just allowing them to to kind of share what they're feeling in that experience. Um, so what ended up happening with this patient is um, through the multiple repeat interactions with uh, our team, we were able to get them started on MOUD and in a follow up clinic. Um, he completed an outpatient program. Um, he did continue to use methamphetamine, but he stopped using heroin, which was a goal of his. Um, he was able to eventually complete the antibiotic treatment. Um, so things that we wanna think about, um, you know, in, in this type of scenario is, what's the goal of the patient um, and what is their optimal functioning level? Sometimes it is not feasible. Um, for a patient to go to a residential facility and, and have complete cessation of use, or um, that may just not be their goal. So just meeting the patient where they're at um, and helping accomplish whatever goals they have, you know, on the whole spectrum of, you know, continuing to use, but, but in a safer way versus complete cessation of all substances. Um, so while in this situation, while, this patient may not have achieved complete remission of the substance use disorder, complete cessation of use. They, he was able to improve his quality of life from the sense of he was able to complete the antibiotics in regards to his infection. He was able to stop using opioids. Um, 
and we were able to promote safer injection practices with the continued methamphetamine use. So, um, you know, we met his goal of stopping a certain substances. We met his goal of improving his quality of life. And so while it's important to recognize that while this may not be, you know, a situation in which we had complete remission, it was still a success story because we were able to improve this person's quality of life and meet meet his goals. Um, so it's important to recognize even just these small wins um, as success stories. Um, and that success in this patient population, it can be on a spectrum and it's not just black and white. So that brings us uh, to the conclusion of the submitted uh, questions and um, scenarios. But at this time, I was wondering if anyone else had uh, questions and it looks like Dr. Nichols does. How often do you find that people are open to changing their route of administration, like switching to intranasal use? Um, I think it depends on um, what the patient, it, it, particularly in the hospital setting, is admitted for. Um, if they're able to understand that there was a significant correlation between injection use and their current infection, um, I find that patients are can be more willing to change their route from that standpoint. I do have patients that I follow in the clinic setting um, who I've seen in the hospital for an injection-related infection, and they have stopped um, using intravenously um, due to that experience. Um, I also try to discuss with them, you know, if a patient um, prefers injection use, considering, um, you know, we talked about booty bumping last time, considering that option, um, you know, as it's comparable in terms of the rush that patients feel um, with you. So I, I, I kind of try to figure out the why, why do you choose injection over other options? Um, and then see if we can find comparable options for them that, that may be a safer route of administration. Yeah. And to touch on what Kayla said, I, I've talked to several patients this week who were former IV substance users who have now started using snorting instead just because of that high risk. And then I had a conversation. I think sometimes it's it's about planting seeds as well when you talk about the safer use strategies. I had a patient who I was talking with this week who um, was using IV but, but wasn't really super open to talking about it. And so we were having um, kind of a harm reduction conversation. She goes, you know, I don't, I don't think I'll inject anymore. I, I, don't, I don't have access anymore. Um, She'd been guarded like the whole time. So that was a perfect opportunity for us to discuss um, alternate means like the booty bumping and she seemed open to that. So even if they don't commit to it right away, I think planting the seeds is an important aspect of this as well. I think uh, one of the questions that just popped up is, is there education that can be provided about risk of infection when snorting? Um, Angela did touch on that uh, during our last presentation. Um, I can have her follow up with a few points from that if she's able to. Yeah, I think the, the highest risk is just when you're sharing equipment, just at risk of any blood or, or bodily fluids, you know, mucus, whatever being transmitted from one person to another. So we have conversations about the risk of HIV and hep C transmission that way. <laughs> 